wicked man. But thou art the God of my strength. Why hast thou to wait on me? And why do I so heavily by the enemy oppressing thee? O set up thy light on thy truth, that they may lead thee and bring thy holy hill into thy dwelling. And I may go unto the altar of God, even as the God of my joy and gladness. And upon the heart I give thanks to thee, O God, my God. Why art thou so heavy, O my soul, and why art thou so disquiet within me? O oh, that I trust in God, for I will give thee thanks. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, the world of thy end. Amen. O Lord of the altar of God, even as the God of my joy and gladness, our help is in the name of the Lord, throughout the age of heaven and earth. I confess, Almighty God, to Blessed Mary, ever virgin, to Blessed Michael the Archangel, to Blessed John Baptist, to the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul, all the saints, and thee, my brethren, that I have sinned exceedingly in thought, word, and deed, by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I beg, Blessed Mary, ever virgin, Blessed Michael the Archangel, Blessed John Baptist, the Holy Apostles, Peter and Paul, all the angels and saints, and thee, my brethren, to pray for thee, the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy upon thee, forgive me thy sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. I confess to Almighty God. Blessed Mary of the Virgin, to blessed Michael the Archangel, to blessed John the Baptist, to the holy apostles Peter and Paul, to all the saints and the Father, that I have sinned exceedingly in thought, word, and deed, by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore I beg, blessed Mary of the Virgin, blessed Michael the Archangel, blessed John the Baptist, to all the apostles Peter and Paul. All the angels and saints, and the Father, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy upon thee, forgive thee thy sins, and bring thee to everlasting life. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant unto us pardon, absolution, and remission of our sins. Amen. Will thou not turn again and quicken us, O God? That thy people may rejoice in thee. Show us thy mercy, O Lord. And grant us thy salvation. Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come unto thee. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee, and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Lord, we pray thee that thy grace may always precede and follow us and make us continually to be given to all good works. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Here's a parable. There was a householder who planted a 
I'd like to begin this morning by making a couple of opening introductory remarks. The first is, is I'd like to set the stage for how this particular parable, the parable of the wicked tenants, takes place. We've been in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 21 for the past three weeks, and last week we had the tenants of the two sons. Remember, one son was a good son and one son was a bad son. And... Um, I just kind of want to review this real quick so that you understand the context in which this parable took place because it's, it's, it's very, very helpful in understanding what we just read. There's some pretty heavy words in it, and matter of fact, it goes on a little bit further than that. I'm going to take us all the way down to verse 44, which the lectionary doesn't cover because next week the lectionary picks back up in 22, and so we don't want to skip any part of the gospel as we move through it, right? So how does it, what, what happens here in verse 21 or in chapter 21? Chapter 21 begins with Jesus' triumphal entry, entry into, the, into Jerusalem. This is Palm Sunday in the beginning of, of his passion. Right? And so as he comes into town, he's on a donkey, the coal of a fold, full of a colt. Excuse me. And, he, um, and they're, they're, they're throwing palm branches out there, and they're putting their cloaks in front of him. And they're saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And they follow him all the way into the... Uh, into the temple, at least the little kids do, and they're saying the same thing. The adults probably knew better than to say that in front of the elders and chief priests, because that is the that is the messianic uh, exclamation. That is that is, you're welcoming the Messiah when you say, "Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest." And so the chief priests and elders of the of the of the uh, of the temple were indignant at Jesus, and then Jesus replies, "Well, you know, what do you expect from the from the mouths of babes and infants comes you know this wisdom." And uh, they're, they're, you know, a little bit besmirked by that. But what can they do because he's got the entire crowd on his side? Very, very important point. He leaves town. He goes out of, um, out of the city. He comes back into the t I'm sorry. That's in the same day. In the same day, he cleanses the temple. So the next thing he does after his triumphal entry and after everyone gives him a messianic exclamation, he clears the temple. Remember the, the money changers? He starts flipping their tables over. He makes a whip out of cords. He starts beating people left and right. Yes, gentle Jesus is beating people and calling them a brood of vipers and a den of thieves and so forth and so on. And he's throwing everybody out of the temple that doesn't belong there. They basically turned it into like a supermarket market slash bank. Okay? And he wasn't going to have any part of that commercial um, thing going on inside the church. He leaves town. Notice that he leaves town because he always has to get out of town, right? The crowd keeps him safe. And, of course, his divine power, but via the crowd in this particular instance. And so, yes, he, he leaves, goes out into Bethany, outside the city. Remember, they arrested him at night, right? There weren't any crowds around, okay? And even at that, he was outside the city, but, of course, Judas betrayed him. But notice that pattern all, all throughout, the, all throughout the, uh, the Passion Week. 
He comes back into town, and what's the first thing he does? Before he gets into town, he sees a fig tree, he curses it, okay? And this cursing of the fig tree is, is, the, is the, I had to put it, the, um, the touchstone for the rest of this, of this particular chapter. Because why? The fig tree didn't produce fruit, okay? If you don't produce fruit, cursed, Okay, and so that's gonna that that takes place throughout this chapter. And then the next thing happens is is that the elders come up to him and they question his authority. What authority do you have to teach and uh, and uh, and to really knock over all of our friends' money changing tables and etc. And he says, "Well, answer me this question, and I'll answer yours." John's baptism was it from God or from man? Now this is a sticky wicket for these guys. John the Baptist's ministry to say that it was huge is an understatement. People came from all over the place to be baptized by this great preacher in the wilderness. It was so powerful that even the, the, um, the, the elders were kind of forced to go out there and get baptized themselves. Or they would have been seen as, you know, not on board with this great message, this great preacher, John the Baptist. The problem is, is that what does John the Baptist say about Jesus? Because everybody knows. I mean, his, his, he said it out loud. I saw the dove descend upon him. I saw the spirit descend upon him like a dove. I heard the voice, this is my son, in whom I am well pleased. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He says that, and disciples start following him. Jesus made all these proclamations. So Jesus' ministry is directly tied to the ministry of John the Baptist. They are a continuation of the same thing. Indeed, John the Baptist was the greatest prophet, and indeed, the Elijah that was to come. So when he asks them, tell me about John the Baptist's baptism, was it from man or from God? That's a serious question. If they say it's from man, the crowds will kill them. Back in these days, man, heresy was dealt with immediately and permanently. The crowds would have risen up, and stoned these guys to death. That would have been the nice ending for them. It could have been, it could actually be worse than that. If he says, well, it was from God, then Jesus will turn around and say, why didn't you believe John the Baptist? You heard what he said about me. So they come up with this genius answer, we don't know. And Jesus says, well, I won't tell you either. We're good. We're just going to stand in a big cloud of Stupidity. So then he says, but I will tell you a parable and two sons, right? Last week, you got the, you got the son who's a, a liar, a coward, and just absolutely um, perfectly content with his flesh and concupiscence, just walking the way of sin, the second son. The first son, you see struggle, right? He says, he's, first he's honest. He's not a liar. He's not a coward. He has the, he has the, 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 the courage of his own convictions, albeit they're wrong at first. But at least he tells dad what he thinks. So the man is honest and courageous, and you see an inward struggle. The man who does not struggle, okay, is the road to perdition. The man who struggles is the first son who, while he doesn't start well, finishes really well. And, and even the chief priest says, oh, yeah, the second son, he's the one that didn't, who did the right thing, the first son. The one who said, no, nah, dad, I'm not going, but, you know. But then actually goes. You see that inward turmoil inside of him. And so, you know, one of the points last week was, is, you know, if you have that inward turmoil, that's a good thing. Parable of the, parable of the wicked tenants. We come to the point. Okay, so before we get there, let's talk real quick about the interpretation of Scripture. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the... Um, the section on how to interpret Scripture gives us four senses in which Scripture can be taken. The literal sense from which all other senses flow. The spiritual sense where things are kind of set in a spiritual context. The allegorical and the anagogical. Okay? All of them are pretty much self-explanatory except that last one, anagogical. What are they talking about there? Um, I'm going to use another word. It probably won't be helpful. If I see a bunch of blank faces, I'm going to go do some more explaining. Eschatological? Okay. So anyway... What that means is, is things that concern the, the consummation of time, the eschaton, the last day. Uh, in some circles, this would be called the historical redemptive approach to Scripture, looking at Scripture as the, as the history of redemption. And, and, and so it's telling the story of God, God's dealing and redeeming man through time. So this would be one way of looking at it. 
Now, this morning, I would like us to go ahead and take a look at this passage uh, first in the anagogical sense and then finally in the allegorical sense. Okay. So, what is... <laughs> Actually, it's funny. When I was reading some commentators this week, they, the first thing I read in this comment, by the way, you know, you can read books on what the Bible says, and some of them are good and some of them are bad, just to let you know that. So if you read a book, it's just one book on what the Bible says, somebody's opinion of what it means, eh, you know, take it with a grain of salt. You may want to read three or four before you, you know, come to some sort of conclusion. The first one said that this passage in no way has any kind of supersessionist meaning. The first thing I did was look up the word supersessionist because even word doesn't recognize it as a, as a word. Okay, But what it means is, is that there's no sense in which Jesus is removing the, the Jewish leadership and replacing them with another leadership. Okay, And they said this because, heaven forbid, that we be anti-Semitic. The funny thing is, is that there's nothing anti-Semitic about God relieving the current Jewish leadership and replacing it with what? Jewish leadership. I mean, who do you think Peter was? Who do you think the 12 apostles were? How is it anti-Semitic that he would take these Jews and say, no, you're not going to run anymore, and put Peter and the 12 in charge of it, and Paul? I mean, you know, these guys are Jews. So there's nothing anti-Semitic about Jesus removing the Jewish leadership. You, you find that a lot. I noticed that there was a lot of that, that back, back blast that came to uh, the filmmaker who made the, the Passion of the Christ. You know, he's, he's anti-Jewish. I'm kind of like, no. No, all the followers of Jesus, to start off with, were Jews. Now, it's true that most of us probably here aren't Jews. By, we're probably not children of Abraham by nature. But we're all engrafted into it. We're all adopted children of Abraham. You know that, right? Okay. So, um, excellent. Uh, so, look at the vineyard. Okay, what is the vineyard? The vineyard is the church. Remember, we're going back to this parable now. Remember, remember, remember the gospel. I know it was just a minute ago, but okay, so there's, there's a guy who builds, a, builds a, a vineyard, he puts tenants in charge of it, they don't like the, tenant, the tenants, he sends them guys to get some fruit, they kill those guys, he sends his son, they kill the son, and that's the end of it. Okay, so the vineyard is the church, okay, who are the tenants? Tenants are the Jewish leadership, the guys he's talking to, remember, he's in this, this ongoing argument with the elders, that's the context, that's why you have to understand chapter 21. It's an argument with the elders, but who's standing over here of the crowd, right? They're here during the daytime. At nighttime, he skedaddles along with the crowd, all right? So that's, what, that's the context that's taking place here. So they're, they're half looking at Jesus, and they're half looking over here because they're definitely afraid that if they say something out of place like John's baptism wasn't from God, they're going to end up in huge trouble with the crowd. And by huge trouble, I mean torn to pieces and killed. All right. So, who are the servants that were sent before the Son? The Old Testament prophets. Again and again and again, God sends prophets into Israel of old to get them to turn from their sin. In a sense, they're like prosecutors suing out a, a, a lawsuit against them for breaking the law which God had given them. That's why they're sometimes called covenant prosecutors. You owe God this. And what they do to them? Well, I mean, read Jeremiah sometime. They, they did everything but kill him. They threw him in a well. Well, they tried to kill him, but he just wouldn't die. But a lot of them they just did kill. Finally, who do they finally who who does the, the, the owner of the vineyard, by the way, owner of the vineyard is God the Father. What is he who's he sent? He sends his son. And what do they do to his son? They kill him. Now, this is, what, what do these guys say about this? This is, this is really very, very instructive. I lost a page. He says, they said to him, he says, he says, when therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? This is, this is the second time now in two, in two parables. They said to him, he will put those wretched wretches to a miserable death. In some, some, some uh, versions it says, he will put those wretches to a wretched death, which actually plays upon the Greek, which uses the same word twice, which has different endings in it. And lease the vineyards to other tenants who will give them their fruit in their season. Now at this point, Jesus doesn't, doesn't start saying, oh yeah, you're right, like he does here. He just says, he said to them, have you never read the scriptures? 
Okay? Now, these are the, some of these among these men are scribes. I mean, they would read the scriptures. You would think they would. The very stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He says, therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing its fruits. If that's not supersessionist, I don't know what is. I'm going to take it away from you and give it to somebody else. That's exactly what it is. Now, I find it curious that they intuitively, they, they accuse themselves when they see this. You ever notice that? And then, by the way, that's the, I don't know if you know this, that's the old form, probably most of you do know this, that's the old form of confession. I accuse myself, Father. Right? And, it, but it's just, it's, a, it's amazing to me that they, they sit there and they accuse themselves, and yet there is a, in some sense, no real repentance whatsoever. Point out this too. Did you notice that when the when the when the prophets were sent, there's no discussion about what to do. They just automatically do it. There, it's a mu kind of mutual consent. But when he sends the son, there's a discussion. Hey, let's kill him, and who's the heir, and then we'll get it ourselves. Why, why do you think that is? Why do you think they have a discussion? Well, I'm just going to speculate here. You see, it's when they, when, they, when, they, when they break into full autonomy, what's going to happen in the next moment after they get rid of the sun and after they get rid of God? They're autonomous, right? I'm, each one of them are saying, I'm free. What's the exact next thing that happens after that? Lord of the Flies. I'm free. And they start bonking each other over the head. Because it's not good enough that God's out of the way. I need to get you out of the way. And you out of the way. And you out of the way. See, autonomy, the sin of autonomy, is not something that just is between you and God. It, it, it happens between us as well. That's why the summary of the law is, is you love God, all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. The first comes first, and the second comes second, and it degenerates in the same order. The sin is rebellion and the murder of God in their hearts. And any autonomy that you want to grasp at is exactly that. It is the sin of murdering God. And make no mistake, every sin is a grasp at autonomy. I want to do what I want to do. You can make excuses for it all day long, but that's what it is in the end. Me, 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 me. I remember one time I saw this little kid in the parking lot and in a and it was literally yelling that at mom. Me, 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 me. It was like two years old. It was, it was hilarious. But think about, you know, those of you who have kids, that like the, the first word that a two-year-old learns. No. And what do they do? They feel the power of that word. There's autonomy in that word. No. No, 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 no. And at first, it's kind of cute. Yeah, you smile. Aw. And then it's not so cute. It's kind of like, <laughs> yeah. Okay? And at that point, the, the child in, encounters the law of God via mom and dad. And, and, they're, and, they're, and they're guided onto the path, uh, usually by some sort of a painful method, in order to, uh, in order to, to correct them. They, they feel the... Uh, the effects of that uh, that rebellion in their flesh, let's say, and um, and are and are corrected. But isn't that so true of the fallen nature of man? I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine, an old friend. I've known him since I was 12 years old, but he's not a Christian. And I told him at this at this one juncture, I said, I said, his name is David. I said, you know, the real problem that you have is is you, that you don't want to to bend to God's authority. That you don't want to, and I use this word on purpose, you don't want to obey him. 
And I knew that it just, that word obey just twisted. Oh. You need to obey God. Oh. oh. Man, the flesh recoils at that, doesn't it? Oh. Obey. Nobody likes that. That's the heart of it, isn't it? Okay, let's look at verse 44, and we'll finish here. There's some pretty, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry the lectionary skips this. I'm sure it didn't do it on purpose. I wasn't supposed to be a joke. Uh, and, uh, and he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Uh, there's no way to make that sound nice. It, it is what it says. I mean, as a matter of fact, in the Greek, it's kind of the word pulverized or the word to beat into dust. It, uh, the finished product is something that cannot be picked up with a fork because it falls through it uh, is the kind of the concept. Uh, yeah, it's bad. It's bad. If, if you read that and say that sounds bad, you got it right. But when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Okay. So four last things. Um, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And two alternatives when you encounter Christ. <coughs> heaven and hell. You can meet the Lord of glory as the judge at the end of time, or you can meet him as your savior. These are the two options. And these are the two options that Matthew is laying out before he, he, us here in Jesus' Jesus's words, is that if you fall on the stone, you'll be broken to pieces. If it falls on you, it'll crush him. Now, the crush him part we get, right? Does anyone, does anyone think for a second that somehow being crushed is a good thing? I didn't think so. Okay. So then what's this broken thing? Okay. Verse, I'm uh, sorry, Psalm 51. This is the psalm. This is when David is repenting of his sin with, with, uh, with Bathsheba. After Nathan comes to him, gives him a parable about the lamb and the guy who took the guy's lamb. And he's, I'm going to kill that person. You're the man. And David struck to the heart. And he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your merciful love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from all my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is ever before me. You're familiar with that psalm. It's one of the seven penitential psalms. Now, this is the psalm that is chanted or recited when Father is doing asparagus. When, when in, during a penitential season, he's going up and down the aisle and cleansing you with holy water. This psalm's being chanted. All right? Now, verse 17. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite, O God, you will not despise. I'm sorry. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In order not to be crushed by the Lord of glory, and I pray that I'm probably at this point preaching to the choir that we're about this, but nevertheless... We need to always remind ourselves, okay, that the, that the place where we need to be is when we encounter Christ to, to, to be broken, broken in heart, broken in spirit. That's the sacrifice that, that God will accept. And it, and, it, and it doesn't just happen once and you move on. This is, a, this is a daily repentance. It's in the morning. It's in the afternoon. It's whenever you realize that you acted out in disobedience, that you acted out in autonomy against God. A constant returning to Christ, broken for your sin. A, f a faithful and frequent use of that confessional back there, where you accuse yourself. You must be broken. You must be broken.
Let us pray for the whole state of Christ, church, and world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, receive these our prayers which we offer unto thee, for thy divine majesty, beseech of thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word, and live unity, God and love. Give grace, O heavenly Father, grant us our hope. Stephen, our bishop, his holiness, Benedict the sixteenth. John, the Bishop of Orlando, and to all bishops and other sacred ministers, especially deacons David and Jason, that they may both, by their life and doctrine, set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with the heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all the people, to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works. The rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or in any other condition. <laughs> and we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants, the part of this life of thy faith and fear. You say you to be merciful and grant the fullness of joy of thy love and service, and to grant us grace and follow the good examples of the Blessed Virgin Mary and of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our mediator and advocate, and with thee, and the Holy Ghost, be all honor and glory. Amen. <clears throat> Ye that do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbors, and intend to lead a new life on the commandments of God, and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith, make your humble confession, Almighty God, and deeply kneeling. Almighty God, Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and pray our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed, by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do our sins to repent, and are heartily sorry that these are our decisions, and remember to them to free the sons of us. Burning them is intolerable, and have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in this life. To the honor and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with heart and repentance. And through faith are not enough. Have mercy on us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness to bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what comfortable words our Savior Christ said to all that truly charge him. Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hear also what St. Paul saith, this is a true saying worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Hear also what St. John saith, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is a propitiation for our sins.
Pray, brethren, that this, my sacrifice and yours, may be acceptable to God the Father Almighty. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of our hands. Praise the Lord in his name. For our good and good of all of us, Holy Church. Cleanse us, O Lord, we pray, that by the effectual working of this, our sacrifice, and so accomplish in us the work of thy mercy, that we may be found worthy to be made partakers of the same, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord be he with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your heart. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is very neat, bright, and our bound in him. We should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God. For with thy co-eternal Son and the Holy Ghost, thou art one God, one Lord, in trinity of persons and in unity of substance. For that which we believe of the Father, the same we believe of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, without any difference or inequality. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy
mystery of faith.
is also his resurrection from the dead, and his glorious ascension into heaven. Do offer unto thine excellent majesty of thine own gifts and bounty, the pure victim, the holy victim, the immaculate victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Thou take to look upon them with a merciful and pleasant countenance, and to accept them, even as thou didst not say to accept the gifts of thy servant people, the righteous, the sacrifice of our patriarch Abraham, and the holy sacrifice, the immaculate victim, which thy high priest, Melchizedek, offered unto thee. We humbly beseech thee, Almighty God, command these offerings to be brought by the hands of thy holy angel to thine altar on high, in sight of thy divine majesty, that all we who have this partaking of the altar shall receive the most sacred body and blood of thy Son, may be fulfilled with all heavenly benediction and grace. Remember also, O Lord, thy servants and handmaids who have gone before us, sealed with the seal of faith, sleep, sleep the peace. To them, O Lord, to all the breasts in Christ, we beseech thee to grant thee a boat of refreshing, of light, and of peace. To us sinners also, thy servants who hope in the multitude of thy mercy, God save to grant to part and fellowship with thy holy apostles and martyrs, John, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicitas, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and with all thy saints within whose fellowship we beseech thee to admit us, not weighing our merit, but granting us forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom, O Lord, thou dost ever create all these good things, thou sanctify, quicken, bless, and bestow them upon.
Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him that taketh away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy of the actions of my heart, but speak the word and my soul shall take healing. Lord, I am not worthy of the actions of my heart, but speak the word and my soul shall take healing. Lord, I am not worthy of the actions of my heart, but speak the word and my soul shall take healing.
sacraments, that we may thereby both now and ever be effectually defended from all bodily temptations through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. The Mass is ended. Depart in peace. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. The beginning of the Holy Gospel according to St. John the Divine. Glory be to you, O Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And it was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came from witness to bear witness to the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but said to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But his manner who received him, and then gave him power to become the Son of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth.